the libel against God clearly stated. W. J. Seaton says, without any apparent sense of irony or shame, if God alone can save, and if all are not saved, then the conclusion must be that God has not chosen to save all. Pink argues that to claim that the purpose of Christ's death was to provide salvation for all is to undermine the very foundations of our faith. What faith is that? How did Augustine and Calvin dare to so malign the Heavenly Father, who the Bible assures us is infinitely more loving, merciful, kind, and gracious than any human could ever be? Calvinism has reduced God's love and compassion to a lower standard than even the ungodly set for one another. Piper ends up one of his most important books, in which he attempts to justify the reprobating God of Calvinism, with this exhortation to the elect readers. We will entrust ourselves to mercy alone. In the hope of glory, we will extend this mercy to others, that they may see our good deeds, and give glory to our Father in heaven. Why should the elect's good deeds cause those who have been predestined to eternal doom to give glory to Calvinism's God, who closed the door of salvation to them? The God-given conscience is offended at the Calvinists rejoicing in their election with no word of sympathy for those who will spend eternity in utter anguish and for whom, from the beginning, there was never any hope. And how could they be concerned for those for whom God has no concern? As for mercy, only if one is absolutely certain that he is among the elect, and how can any Calvinist be certain, dare he trust himself to the mercy of this otherwise unmerciful God? For the non-elect there is no real mercy, for any blessings in this life are nullified by an eternity of torment. Nor need the Calvinist be merciful, except, like his God, toward those whom it pleases him to be merciful. John MacArthur writes an entire book attempting to prove that God is loving and merciful toward those whom he has predestined to eternal torment, because he gives to them sunshine and rain and temporal blessings in this brief life. Only a Calvinist could possibly think in such terms. Would we commend the grace and love of a mass murderer who always gives a hearty meal to his victims just before he tortures and kills them? Ah, but God is sovereign, and the clay can't complain about what the potter has made of it. On the contrary, we are not mere lumps of clay, but creatures made in the image of God and to whom he has lovingly promised salvation, if we will but believe. Calvinism's God offends the conscience that the God of the Bible has put within all mankind, tramples upon the very compassion with which the one who is love has imbued even the ungodly, and manifests a lower standard of behavior toward multitudes than he requires of us toward our enemies. Something isn't right. The real issue is not God's sovereignty, to which all agree. The issue is God's mercy and grace motivated by love. Calvinism's limited and irresistible grace is no grace at all.